Welcome to Nourishing the Mother, where inspired women talk about the journey of motherhood through the common thread of parenting, relationship, and sexuality as a path to consciousness. We ask, in what ways can we show up more fully, live more meaningfully, parent more wholly, and love more unconditionally? How can we mine the wisdom from the experiences of our lives and expand into those challenges? If you are here, you care about paving a path of conscious and intentional motherhood, connected with yourself and your gifts and also illuminating your children in theirs, so we may raise more whole humans who can impact this world in a more humane way. And if you feel like giving a little back to this free content, please become a patron of the show and receive extra member benefits for less than a coffee a month. Or you can leave a review on iTunes and Facebook all of which helps the podcast keep going and reach more mamas who need this type of tonic for the soul. Head on over to patreon.com forward slash NTM podcast to find out more. We are Julie Tenner and Bridget Wood, and we are so grateful you're here. Hello and welcome to Nourishing the Mother. I'm Bridget Wood. And I'm Julie Tenner. And today's podcast is, ah, sweet, devilish toddlerhood. (laughs) (laughs) Before we jump into that conversation, and we hope it's one that you feel listened to, heard, seen, felt, and hopefully a little inspired by, Mm. I'd love to remind you to jump onto nourishingthemother.com.au, scroll on down to the red banner, drop in your email, and be part of our Nourishing the Mother tribe, where Mm. once every so often we send you out an email and you don't miss anything that's happening in the world that might be an opportunity for you to nourish your inner mother. So nourishingthemother.com.au, come join us. Mm. So this podcast came about because Julie and I were talking about toddlerhood and I was laughing because I recalled probably, it must be, I don't know, 18 months ago, we recorded a podcast on toddlers and toddlerhood when you were like in the depths of, of frustration with Gwen at that age. And I was like, really? Oh, I love toddlerhood. Like, I think it's so, so, so fun and such a great age. And like, now I was, I was saying to Julie, oh, I remember now. <laughs> Pearl's 15 months and it's just that I mean it's beautiful and I love it but also far out like you know those days where they just make noise at you and you can't meet the need because they don't know what even their needs are like it's just those days when you're trying to get all of the other things done and then you have a toddler yeah and I think it's the constancy Mm. like at no other age even when they're younger and they're little babies we tend to think that they need more care when they're littler but I don't think so because I actually think it's this toddlerhood age which I think actually can start around 10 months depending on where your child is at yeah yeah Um, And certainly around that nine to 10 months when they go through a sleep progression and then they turn into toddlers, I do think that that's also a really um, tricky phase. Mm. So I kind of think toddlerhood for me as the challenge could start anywhere from 10 months Mm. and last up until about two. So, I mean, that's a pretty solid year. (laughs) (laughs) But um, what I really remember from that is, like at no other age are you required physically Mm. and emotionally and mentally basically just to be so on yeah because it literally is yeah five minutes 10 minutes at the most that you Mm. ever get to yourself in that entire waking period day after day because they need you, they're getting into stuff, they're not safe, they haven't got awareness. It's like Mm -hmm. this constant, either they're doing something that you need to intervene with or they're about to and you need to help them or they need something and you need to help them. It's like this constant, I remember trying to work during that phase with, um, I suppose most particularly with Gwen, but we had started nourishing, no, it wasn't probably a big thing when I had Lola but definitely with Gwen and thinking, this is brutal. I cannot work out how to work 
and do motherhood. It just, I see all these mums that are like, well, you just like set up an activity and they just independent play and you just like get to do your thing. And I'm like, what the actual fuck is going on here? Because I'm getting 10 minutes and that's it. <laughs> So I really get it because I remember that conversation. I was like, Bridget, you don't get it. (laughs) (laughs) Which in my head also I'm going, she does get it. She's done it before. But I also think that we we forget or potentially it's about a different child and Mm. a different experience also because, of course, one toddler is completely different to another toddler. Mm. And you may have a dream toddler just like there's dream sleep babies that may actually exist. I don't, I don't deny it, but um, my experience of toddlerhood has always been one that, that I've um, really had to navigate with increasing awareness of the challenge that I find um, in never having more than five or 10 minutes without really needing to be on, mm. which I think doesn't exist in, in any other part of parenthood, you know, newborn and infancy. Included. Well, I think, you know, before they're crawling, if you've set a baby up to really, um, feel good in independent play like you know being on the mat or just being able to be in their own space and mind then you can have those little longer stretches because you know that they're in one place but once they're crawling and they're into things that that you you know I kind of have these heart attacks when I'm like where's Pearl (laughs) who's seen Pearl you know because yeah I'm terrified that she's shoved something in her mouth she's somehow one of the kids has left the front door open and she's crawling out the front door you know like you're always having to have that awareness and beyond like she's banging on the door right now (laughs) (laughs) which just sums up toddlerhood because even when you're not on there's this like mom like even when you and I um, we went for an exercise in ISO the other day down to the beach and even that you were like needing to navigate something with the older kids and she's like "Ah," crawling after you and I was like oh my God, I remember that. <laughs> because even when you're not there, they're still clawing after you to yeah. be there. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, you, you want to be that for them, but I think the more children you have, the more that you realise that you have to also make it okay to not meet every need for them, you know, to, to not meet every cry and every request because if you made yourself try to do that, you would be guilt-ridden and completely strung out mm. as well. And that's been the process for me of having more children is recognising, you know, how much um, I have to allow the the disappointment in her that I'm not always going to be there every second because I'm navigating all of the other things and similarly the older children. Mm. So, mm. yes, beautiful, magnificent, but also intense and overwhelming at times and mm. exhausting. And then if you're a parent who has a toddler that doesn't really sleep or that you're a parent who is still co-sleeping perhaps with a toddler and you feel like you get no space at night or during the day, then it is exhausting. And that for me is is why I think I'm glad that I felt into my desires at around nine or ten months with her and recognised that it wasn't good for me or her to be continuing to co-sleep because I was getting resentful. And I was feeling like that I wasn't being um, boundaried in a way that was kind to myself or kind to her. And so making that separation at that time, I think, has actually made it um, more nourishing this time with her because I can feel that I have um, some sovereignty around my body at least um, for a period of time um, Mm. as opposed to feeling like I'm giving up at all for this phase and being swallowed by it, um, Mm. which I know what that feels like. Um, So the years of learning of what both secure attachment and boundaries can look like has been a very fruitful journey, I think, in terms of being able to feel like I can hold the space for her as much as possible in the day while also knowing that at night, like, you have your space and I have mine. Mm. And that feels really good because I want to be able to switch off, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I really do. I really get it. I really get it. And I really hope that gives other mums permission because I, I don't think that we were ever designed to be everything to one person. Mm any of us no and I think too for the mothers who are navigating this time in COVID where we're really having to you know have 
you know, resource ourselves within ourselves because there isn't other people knowing what those boundaries look like and being willing to give yourself permission to set them up and hold them is 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 of utmost importance I think because we don't have for many of us particularly who are in stage four lockdown we don't have the people that we can lean on to help share the responsibility of care with and without that you know like this is almost unprecedented in many ways and for many women to be able to expect yourself to hold such Mm -hmm. um intense levels of care uh without continuously continuously 24 7 without support and you know uh, like already motherhood I was talking about this with another mum friend of mine and you know she, as she was saying it motherhood is already isolating mm. very often with young children but then add something like this over the top and you have you know for many women what can feel oppressive because you feel so um at the mercy of the needs of the toddler um, mm. which I have such deep compassion for women for because when we don't. Yeah, me too. You know, like because that that is really hard to to hold and be with and then not let that resentment bubble over into all of those relationships which you value so much and mm. into that child which you value so much. Mm. What do you think then if you're starting to feel resentment is or resentment building is the strategies I think I would be asking myself, what am I expecting myself to be right now? So sometimes the resentment can come from an idealised version of yourself as a mother or an idealised version of motherhood or your need to be the entertainer all of the time and that that overgiving or that that sense of guilt that can override um, your ability to be present with your child then can mean you feel resentful towards yourself and your child for being in that space and for being put in that position. So I'd become aware, first of all, of what identity or what you're making meaning around it with, what you're saying to yourself, what you're saying to your child, um, what idealistic views you have of who you're supposed to be and how you might be falling short and where they've come from. Because sometimes it may simply mean that you need to lower your expectations of yourself to be all of the things Mm -hmm. and to recognise what you need right now like so for example yesterday because I think when we're in like lockdown and this we're having to not only hold our child's emotions and meet them but we're all having to navigate our own and we can feel like in motherhood because there's so much doing that there's no space for our own or there's no room Mm -hmm. for us to feel what's there but you'll notice if you're not willing to feel what's there then it's going to come out in other ways it's going to come out in ways where you're going to snap where you're going to be rough with your child where you're going to blame your partner you know where you're going to all of that muck and mess and sludge and frustration you're going to turn it up into other ways if you're not willing to be with it so I recognized that I was feeling Mm. agitated and resentful because I was getting annoyed with my four-year-old for not riding fast enough right because you know four-year-olds are like so great on a bike (laughs) (laughs) so I realized that okay I'm getting pissy and it's not really at her it's 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 at my feelings I haven't met so with the two girls home and my son out riding, I, I put on a playlist. Of, I was Googling on Spotify. I was looking through Spotify to try and find the most saddest playlist I could find. And then yeah. I just put that on and I laid on the couch with the two girls playing near me and I just cried for like half an hour. And it was so good. And I was like, I was get, I'd find one song and it was really cathartic and I felt every kind of thing and just moved it through me. And then another song would come on and it wasn't quite it, so I'm flicking through to find the next song. And what that did, I just thought, gosh, this is such a gift, not only for me to move these feelings but also for my girls to see how healthful it is to, for me to carve out that space to be with myself and to be with what needs to move through me and to take ownership. You know, and in the process I was saying to my four-year-old, look, I'm sorry I got really angry when you're riding your bike that wasn't fair you know how did that feel when I got angry with you and she said oh it felt like you were being mean and I'm like oh sorry I'm really trying to be with those feelings right now because it wasn't fair for me to be angry with you about not riding fast enough (laughs) it was pretty ridiculous and I thought it was really beautiful because we can 
if, if we've got a story on like mothers, motherhood having to be busy and like frantic and like no time and space for ourselves, then we can often self perpetuate that story and that kind of like nervous system um, patterning in just being busy for the sake of being busy and thinking that our worth is in that. But I really felt like this to carving out the space to be with what was in my body was a real pattern breaker. Um, for me and for my like mother's story where I could see that actually whenever any feeling came up about needing to do something I was like oh no 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 what I'm doing now this is intergenerational healing because I am helping my daughters stop and be with what's going on inside and take ownership of what's going on inside and that in itself is purposeful that in itself is life-giving and then once they got when once they got to see me move all of that and reflect on how I was feeling after I'd, you know, had had my cry, then I got to be in connection with them because I had that had gone, as opposed to me like letting it, you know, fester away and fill me with resentment the rest of the day for my husband to then come home and me need to check out because I was just holding it together, like instead just allowing myself, even with children at my feet, to be with what was there in a way that was embodied and didn't make them responsible for it. I just thought like it's 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 that reminder again that that in itself is teaching, that in itself is mothering. It doesn't have to look like how we emotion coach them or, you know, all of the activities that we provide for them or all of the stimulation we provide for them. Our willingness to be congruent to humans is a gift and is teaching in and of itself that is the blueprint and I think that we often don't give ourselves permission to be that because we don't see those examples of mothers being you know and owning the full feeling of emotions that need to move through us as humans in a way that doesn't make children responsible for them right Mm. Oh, I just love that so much. Can I just ask context because I can hear some of our listeners going, but how are your kids in that? Like, were they scared? Were they worried? Did mm. you, like, what did that look like with children? Yeah, so Pearl was, wasn't was really that fast. Pearl kind of would come up to me and just could, like, bang on the couch and so I'd sort of grab her hands or I'd pick her up on me and, like, have a cuddle with her. Um, and Sylvie... She was funny. She was, at one point she was like, I don't like this song. And I was like, oh, why? How does it make you feel? And she said, oh, I was scared. I was like, okay, do you want to come with me and we can choose another song? And so it was great to invite her into that experience with me, but also me reaffirm for her. Like I was saying to her, I really want to listen to these songs because they're helping me feel the feelings in my body and those feelings in my body need to be released right now. And she, she she plays quite well independently, so she just brought her play closer to me because I think she felt the, the desire to be close and and just be in my space in that, which I think is quite lovely, really. But yeah, there wasn't really a sense that that I that I had to do anything with them. It was more just about making it safe for them to be in that space with me and for me to be able to communicate to them that my, my feelings are my feelings and they're not responsible for them, but that I'm using this time to be with them and, and, and transform them. And so when you said uh, after it, when you, um, I can't remember the words you used, but reviewed or reflected or whatever it was with them, what did that look like? Um, I think after that, I think, I think Sylvie wanted to go outside and so I kind of shifted some stuff. So we went outside and we were sitting on the trampoline and I was explaining to her, you know, did you notice how I was feeling before and I was crying? And, and in before that, before I set up that time to have a cry, I was quite angry, wasn't I, when we were riding home? And that was when I had the opportunity to talk to her then and I was saying to her, yeah, like I realised when I was angry that actually underneath my anger was just some sadness and I needed to feel my sadness. So... I'm sorry that I got really angry with you because it wasn't really about whether you were riding fast enough or not. It was just because I was feeling angry and it wasn't really fair that I spoke to you the way I did. So I just wanted to say sorry. And so we just had that conversation on the trampoline. I didn't make it a big deal of it. It was more just a, you know, let's make this safe, right? Let's make all of this safe. And let, let's because I talked to my kids so much about the ownership of their feelings towards each other that I, I can't ask them to do that with each other if I can't do that first because it's, it's so incongruent. 
So it was that really, it was that process of, of then shifting, you know, into a different environment and, and, and making that link from those earlier feelings to also see that she might've needed her own completion from not knowing why I was so angry too, because particularly for kids who are largely respectfully parented to then have like, you know, moments of you kind of having an outburst, it can be really destabilizing because they're kind of like, what? That was so out of character. I need, I could see that she needed a, a process with me of kind of coming back into connection after that rupture between mm. us. And so that, yeah, that looked like play for us and, and you know, a cuddle and all of those things. It's so beautiful. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, and I, need, I needed it. I think I didn't realise. I mean, it's my first, it's my husband's first week back in a job after him being home for an extended period. And, yeah, like, you know, as you'll know, like three kids in ISO in stage four lockdown. Oh, it's it was brutal. pretty heavy, you know. Oh, it's brutal. And there was stage some- four lockdown is, is full on, yeah. particularly when it's been such an extended period of time. Yeah, yeah. And I think also just when you feel the weight, the bigger like weight of it beyond my bubble to feel what's going on outside the, collective. the bubble. Yeah. yeah. Like I can feel that in my energy. Yeah. And so that's just a really constant, I can feel that there. And so then I feel that that also means that I have to be more responsible with my own processing when I'm around them all of the time and that mm. there is no way to escape. I mean, the, the beautiful thing of this is, is, is that it reveals to you every device you've ever used or any um, external attachment that you ever use to try to get yourself like through your life or your challenges. And it, when it pulls all of those away, it asks you to face yourself. Mm. And like that can be deeply challenging, mm. but then really freeing as well when you meet it. Mm. Mm. And so, so in, in the context of resentment, that's how we'd got around to you talking about your story of the bike ride. Mm. Can you just tie that up for me in a nice little bow and let me know how that feeds into feeling resentful towards our toddlers? Mm. So I'm trying to think about, back about that original question because I got so far off that question. Um, we can feel the feeling resentful towards our toddlers is really, I think, feeling resentful towards the time that they take up for from, from us, right? And that, I think, also comes from our lack of value on our parenting of them or our lack of value on the investment of time that it takes to guide a toddler because it can be also so all-consuming. We don't recognise the beauty of that investment in time and what we get back from that. Because I can see that when actually I'm intentional with her and that I carve out space to take myself slowly through her caregiving and that I, rather than feel like I have to rush her through things or, you know, feel the external pressures and instead be with them, it is actually really life-giving. But it's that. But when I hit those edges of resentment where it feels like all everybody wants something of me all at once. That's that reminder again of what am I expecting of myself? What am I expecting of my child? Like, is it reasonable or not? Because particularly when you've got other older children, it's easier to think that like the youngest one should get stuff quicker <laughs> just because you're used to being able to communicate well and, and yeah. move at a different pace with older children. And the yeah. thing with toddlers is that you just have to slow it right down so much. Mm. And that is such a spiritual practice, I think, of and, mm. and also an ego practice of recognising where you think other things are more important than this, mm. than, than this moment right here to be the guide, which is a beautiful. I can hear a child crying outside the door. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking that my husband might get a. Is that Sylvie? I do, yeah. I think Marcus is getting a. No. Oh, Jesus. What? <laughs> you got it all going oh, on, Bridge. Oh, my God. <laughs> How are you doing? <laughs> so apparently, apparently, um. <laughs> She asked Marcus if she could have ice cream and he said no and then she locked him out and said, you're a bad daddy and came in. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, she's a genius. <laughs> uh, so there you go. 
<laughs> maybe I was getting too, like maybe on the podcast I was getting too, um, what's the word? Fantastical in my mothering and I needed to be brought down a notch. <laughs> oh, I don't know about that. I just kind of think it's delightful. I mean, I kind, I kind of love that stuff. I'm like... <sighs> I don't think that's the genius of children, isn't it, is when they work out, I mean, that's manipulation yeah. in its learning form, right, yeah. is I've worked out how to manipulate this situation and you, Bridget, as my mum and Marcus <laughs> as my dad, to get what I want. I know exactly how to play this note. Yeah, totally. I know I need to cry for you at your door and I know <laughs> dad needs to be bad and I'm going to win. <laughs> so I just kind of go... It's genius. Yeah, like, as totally. opposed to having any layer of, oh my God, that's a bit shameful or bad. Like, I'm like, wow, look at what you have totally worked out. Like, and for my kids, you've totally got it nailed, right? <laughs> you cry for me, I'm going to be there. Yeah. You tell your true. dad he's bad, he's going to crumble too. Like, mm. they've worked it out. Mm. Is that not it's genius? It's so true. It's so true. They know the exact way it's in. Yeah. yeah. I, can't, I can't leave a crying kid at my door. Like, I'm right. <laughs> Nor could I. But the truth is, they know that. Yeah, <laughs> totally. <laughs> and we can look at that and go, oh, God, you know, um, all revolt against, which I certainly used to do, that whole concept of children are manipulative. But I look at it and I go, that is social learning. Yeah. Like that's part of being able to create a win-win and negotiate as an Mm. adult is to know the currency of the other person and be able to utilize that to get a win. Like it's such, it's such a great way of explaining it. Like the currency of that person. Yeah. Because you know, like the currency in our family is like mom holds space for emotions and dad is, dad is the playful one, you know, like dad will play through like, you know, everything yeah and they learn that and like if we tried to make our partner parent the way that we parent or you know they try to shape ours like our kid kind of misses out because they need both and they understand the intersection of both geniusly I yeah I kind of watch those dynamics and just think wow Mm. that's like amazing and by the time you get to number four you've got no hope because (laughs) number four is just a loose cannon (laughs) so any sense of ego really truly has been totally obliterated with number four because she's just so fat to use your words so fantastical in the way that she has characterized every single human in this family yeah and plays it with such proficiency I'm like it's fucking gold like (laughs) just to witness it just to witness that ability it's amazing like I really do I sit there and go that's incredible (laughs) it's kind of like comedians you know how comedians can say the truth but it's like it's wrapped up in this delicious context of humor and um social acceptableness that it gets the truth home but in a way that everyone can like move and joke and yeah and like it's it's a genius it's a yeah. skill the, 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 it's the, such the, a skill in any other way it would be like oh. kind of judged and ridiculed but because they they right. wrap it in such a way it's, it's yeah safety yeah like my number four where I'm in so much trouble with her. <laughs> my son started like going, cause he's nearly 15. He's like, Oh my God, if I did that, you'd tell me off. <laughs> and then here I am, she's doing it. And I'm like laughing. Oh my God, you cute little thing. <laughs> and like we're in so much trouble. Just to give you contact. Did I tell you about the tennis racket the other day? Did I tell you about that? No, no, you didn't. So to give you context on how this works every day in my family and many, many, many times a day, if there's anything to be said, this little three-year-old has like taken it in and she'll spit it back out at you in such a way that you go, oh, you know, so if I'm like, like this morning we were playing Monopoly and I shoved a cheese on my mouth and went, oh yeah. And she goes, don't you talk with your mouth full. <laughs> and I was like... <laughs> Uh huh. <laughs> and then the other day she was out the backyard with my son was playing basketball on the basketball court. And we have tennis rackets and stuff out there. And she picked up a tennis racket and she threw it at him. And he looks at her and goes, don't throw the tennis racket at me, Gwen. And so she goes, and she goes and picks it up, moves back a bit, swings it around, throws it at him again, <laughs> hits him again. Gwen, you cannot throw the tennis racket at me. That is not okay. And she goes, mm-hmm. She grabs it up again, plays around with it, looks at him again, throws it at him again. And so this time he looks at her and he picks up the tennis racket and he piffs it down the other end of the backyard. Oh, yeah, yeah. And she looks at him and she goes, Heath, you can't throw a tennis racket. 
though isn't it right is that <sighs> she is breaking every single rule that i think i exactly. have in control yeah well that i think i've constructed and have in control i mean it's the truth that control is such an illusion right yeah because i think i have these structures firmly in place and she just obliterates them every day <laughs> and in such a way that you love the fact that she's obliterating them i'm like it's fucking genius yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> like it's amazing like to the point where I, so I watch this stuff and I go wow you've totally you see me clearer than I see myself oh yeah like it's amazing oh it's amazing and like kind of like unsettling but like you still love it <laughs> yeah yeah and I think toddlers are that right like yeah. I mean my toddler's just turned three so she's just moved from that toddlerhood to that preschooler Mm. and I do think that that's a you know that's a really big it's a really big leap but they've already learnt you in toddlerhood yeah like in toddlerhood they're absorbing it all it just so happens that in preschool years they can verbalize it that's it because they're already feeling they're already like I even look at how much Pearl understands now so yeah Yes, so much. So much. Just because they don't have words for it doesn't mean that they're not the smartest person in the room right yeah. now. I've, we've already taught her how to, how to open and close the back door. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. And, they, and like, I th- and often whenever they, whenever they're at this age and they start to grasp stuff like that, I'm like, oh god, like what else could I be teaching that she'd actually be really capable of understanding that, w- that but that we don't realise as well. Yeah. Oh, hundred percent. Hundred percent, but it's also that thirst for information that I think makes them particularly challenging because yeah. their their entire world is like they're like feed me, feed me. I need to you know like take it in and learn and do all yeah. of the dangerous stuff that I don't yeah. know is dangerous yet. And I think that's part of what makes it so intense. And also, I think too because they're growing so quickly and they're opening up to the world so quickly that they like you, you might think that you have like a routine or a rhythm but they are just changing that up every time that you think that you might have it nailed you know they're at this next stage where they want to go outside first thing in the morning so you've got to go and clean up the dog poo or they mm. want to go do this and so you're kind of having to morph the needs constantly mm. to to mm. fit both the toddler yourself and the older children and the family because of the speed at which they're developing like it's all 100%. coming to coming to together at such a f- frantic rate, I think sometimes. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Yeah. So if you are in toddlerhood, we want you to know we feel you. Yeah. We've been there. I've been there four times. <laughs> <laughs> Bridget's been there three times. Yeah. And he's there now. Yeah. I, th- I so, think what gets reminded you with toddlerhood as well is you don't need to fix the feelings. Like the feelings are okay. I think it becomes stressful for mothers when, when they un- either consciously or unconsciously are trying to avoid the big feelings in a toddler or are trying to avoid their toddler's um, resistance to things or um, just their big feelings, right? And so you kind of like morph and change to meet the toddler's needs and then all of a sudden you're realising that you're actually contorting yourself or minimising yourself in order to keep the toddler happy, which is actually really an unsafe place for the toddler because they don't Mm. want nor need that kind of power. The power lies with you in the structure that you hold. Mm. But you've got to be willing to feel the feelings that come up for you and witnessing the feelings in them. Mm. And that is where you find your capacity actually, I think, is your willingness to breathe into that and allow their movement of feeling and expression and knowing that the more that you do that, the more they're actually coming back into their own centre and actually more freedom too because they're not holding it all in their little bodies. They Mm. know that with you they can feel it. So that that, that, And that's that's the literacy that you and I have built over years, right, but that Mm. I think is worth saying again for perhaps the mother who's not um, as practised in that. Because I actually think the parenting becomes infinitely more easeful when you're not trying to avoid feel, avoid the expression of feeling. Oh, my God, so much. Like 100%. Yeah, so much. So amen. I love what you yeah. just said. Good. 
So Great. to connect with you, Bridgie. Yes, suburbansidecastles.com. And you, Jules? Thepleasurenutritionist.com. And us is nourishingthemother.com.au, Nourishing the Mother on Facebook, Instagram, and Pinterest, as well as obviously our podcast on the wellness couch. Yeah. So. so remember to nourish the woman to rock the family. And we'll see you next week when we continue to peel back the layers on your mothering journey. And if you want to support Nourishing the Mother and all the late nights, the early mornings, the blood, sweat and tears we pour into our art, then please go to patreon.com forward slash NTM podcast and become our patron. As a patron, you're helping all of the cost of operating this podcast, the hosting, the editing, the transcription, helping all of that be completely covered and joining a community who are all about honoring our journeys and continuing to open. The more support we have, the longer we can last. So become a patron. We'd love to have you. Go to patreon.com forward slash NTM podcast. We literally couldn't do this without you. Thank you so much for listening and please share this podcast with anyone you think it would be medicine for. This has been a production of thewellnesscouch.com. Check us out on Facebook and join in the conversation on facebook.com forward slash thewellnesscouch. Subscribe to each show on iTunes and check us out on Twitter. The Wellness Couch, streaming wellness into your lives. Whilst the Wellness Couch presenter endeavor to provide accurate and helpful information to their listeners, these podcasts cannot take into account individual circumstances and are not intended to be a substitute for health and medical advice from a qualified health professional. You should always seek the advice of a qualified health professional before acting on any of the information provided by any of the Wellness Couch podcasts.